night and to hear Joy sing. Did you know it's, that's a miracle in itself? That little girl, how can she think of all that? And each night she has us a new one. Uh, she can think of all that. That's a, really a little master mind. Amen. The Lord bless that child. Now, tomorrow at 2.30 at the um, funeral home in Charleston, Indiana, our dear departed sister, Sister Calvin, we give her the last respects to her at the, at the funeral home and at the grave tomorrow afternoon. One who once lived as you are tonight and has passed beyond the veil where you will sometime. And all who wish to attend this service why, is welcome to come. It will certainly be a great help to the Calvin family to know that the tabernacle here where they have all went to church for so long and so forth. Well, we'd be glad to have you come up. And I thank the, our dear brother McKinney, the one who preached my brother's funeral many years ago as the main part of the funeral, and I've been asked to come and help him in, uh, in the funeral services. Now, I was just a little late tonight. I uh, got so many irons in the fire, I don't know which way to go. There's so many calls and these wrecks and accidents and people calling, coming. To just left Louisville a few moments ago to get back here quickly. And leaving several calls, it's real strenuous and sh must be made a guess yet tonight. And now, pray for us as we go along. And this morning, I, I never did get to my, my text, to the seventh chapter of the book of, of, of Hebrews. And while we're turning to it tonight, I want to make the announcement about Brother Grim Snelling's meeting up at the tent up here at the end of Brigham Avenue. The Lord willing, I want to be back Wednesday night. And there we'll set a certain night that we're going to go up as a delegation this week sometime to visit Brother Grimm in the meeting. And he's, uh, so he's having a nice crowd and, and he'll appreciate us coming for this help. Brother Grimm Snelling, any of you attending the meeting or wish to, it's just at the end of Brigham Avenue up here. Anyone can tell you where it's at, right at the end of the playgrounds. The tenth setting. And he appreciates your cooperation because we as a tabernacle have pledged our cooperation with him 100%. So we're trying to help. Now, then soon we're coming down to the place of the Lord willing to the eleventh chapter of Hebrews. In a few nights, if God willing. And there I think we're going to have a great time also. Oh, the Lord blessed us this morning in a marvelous way. Amen. How He did pour out His Spirit upon us. And now, tonight, we're expecting Him to do it again. Amen. And then Wednesday night and on, and, and the nights that I miss, Brother Neville will be here to pick it right up if I'm out. I never know what I'm going to do. You might be here at this hour, and another hour will be called to California. See, you don't know just where the Lord will send. That's the reason it's hard for me to make itineraries and say, we'll, we'll do so-and-so. I can start to do a certain thing. The Lord sent me somewhere else, see? Amen. So we don't know just what He'll do. But if the Lord is willing, we say it. Amen. I think we're commissioned, they're commanded that in the Bible. Amen. If the Lord is willing, Amen. we'll do so-and-so things. That's right. So if we don't happen to make appointments that we or fulfill appointments, we feel that maybe the Lord wasn't willing for it to happen. The other day we were detained, Brother Roberson and Brother Woods and myself, and we wondered why I sat there looking at a map, coming right down, and we drove 50 miles right straight back north again on a road. Now I've been traveling on the highway since I was about 14 years old, and I wondered how I ever done it. We were standing there, all three of us, we've all traveled the highways, looking right at a map. Keeping on 130, coming through Illinois, and made a little slight turn, not noticing that the sun was behind us instead of front of us. We was going north instead of south. And first thing, no crossroad. I said, this ain't the right road. Looked down there and come to find out we were 50 miles out of the way. Going right straight back. Then when we come back, we, we were talking. I said, you know why? We, the Lord, might have bypassed us this way to keep from having a horrible accident down here somewhere. It might have done something otherwise. We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. That's all we have to keep on mind. 
Now, tonight we're starting now for a little teaching lesson. And if I, I don't think we'll get down, maybe we will tonight, to this is a great chapter of teaching on tithings to the church. And it's a great subject, which we could stay on it for weeks and weeks on that one thing, how Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And whether it's essential. Is this fan hurting anybody back here? We'd rather have it off if it's hurting anybody blowing in their face. Any of the fans, if it is, just raise your hand. And, or just send one of the ushers, send someone up to the brother here, and he'll snap it off for you. And I kind of keep it off of myself. I get hot, and I get to sweating, and the first thing you know, I'm, I'm hoarse. So it's on you. So it won't bother me in any way. We want you to be comfortable now. We're not going to try to take too much of your time. But just go to look straight into the Word. And before we do it, let's speak to the author just a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we do not know what's in store. But the only thing that we do know and are persuaded that good things lay before us. Amen. For it's written, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard. Neither has it entered into the hearts of men what God has for them in store that love Him. And we pray that you'll open the windows of heaven tonight in your storehouse. And give us thy word that will be something that's suitable. Something to increase our faith as Christians. And make us more, more settled on the gospel than what we were when we come in. Grant it, Father. May the Holy Spirit take the word of God and deliver it to each heart as we have need. In Jesus' name we pray, thy beloved Son. Amen. Amen. Now this morning, in leaving... The last verse for the sixth chapter, so we can go right into the seventh. Where are the forerunner for us has entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now we're going to read the first three verses, or the first two verses, or the first three verses, rather, of the seventh chapter, so we can get started right off. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, there's your tithings, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, neither beginning, ha, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. What a wonderful statement. Now, we're going to have to go back in the Old Testament. To dig these great kernels out. And oh, how I love them. You know, out in Arizona, we used to prospect. And we get into a suitable looking piece of ground. Mr. McAnilly and myself, and we would see a place where it looked like in the little ditches. Where a little drain, what they call washes. And I'd, he'd get me down and make me rub the sand and blow it. Then rub and blow it. And I wondered why he did that. Come to find out to see when you're blowing sand is light. And all, even to lead, is lighter than gold. Gold is heavier than lead. So when you're blowing, all the rest of the metals and sand and dirt will blow away, but gold will remain on the ground. Therefore, if you got some washings from up in here, it shows there's a streak of gold somewhere up in there, this Rain has washed these little pieces out. So there we get the picks and so forth and dig the hill up almost, trying to find this gold. Bore holes in the ground, dig them out, set dynamite, blow it down, keep on blowing shafts, going down till we found to find the main vein. Now, that's what we call prospecting. And tonight, we're trying to take the Word of God and... Use it by the power of the Holy Spirit 
to blow all the indifference and doubts away from us. Amen. All those little light, fluffy things that just doesn't have any foundation, doesn't have any weight in our life. We want to blow it all away so we can find this glorious vein. Amen. That vein is Christ. And now may God help us as we read and study in His Word. In the last previous three chapters almost, we've been speaking of hearing just now and then Melchizedek. Now I think Paul gives the right interpretation for this Melchizedek, king of Salem... King of Salem. And any Bible scholar knows that Salem was formerly, Jerusalem was formerly called Salem. And he was a king of Jerusalem. Watch him. Priest of the Most High God, that's an intercessor, who met Abraham. I want to get his genealogy. This great man, so that you'll know who he is first, and then you will go on with the story. Returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part, first by interpretation, king of righteousness. Amen. Now watch. Righteousness. Now we have self righteousness, we have make believe righteousness, we have perverted righteousness. All kinds, but there's one real righteousness. And that righteousness comes from God. And this man was a king of righteousness. Who could he be? Uh, He was a king of righteousness. The king of Jerusalem. The king of righteousness. The king of peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Amen. And a prince is the son of a king. Amen. So this man was king of peace. Then he would have to be the father of the Prince of Peace. Amen. Get it? Amen. Right. Now let's see, get his genealogy a little further to see where we're going. Without father... Now, Jesus had a father. Do you believe that? Sure he was. Without mother. Jesus had a mother, but this fellow had neither father nor mother. Without descent. He never had anyone to come off of. Any descent. He always was. Without descent. Having neither beginning of days. He never had any time he ever started. Nor the end of life. It could have been nothing else but God. That's all it could be. Now, now if you notice as we read the next verse, see? First, being by interpretation king of righteousness. That's not where I want to do the, the third verse. Or end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. Now, he was not the Son of God. For if he was a son, he had a beginning. And this man had no beginning. If he was a son, he had to have both father and mother. And this man had neither father nor mother. But he was made like unto the Son of God. Abideth the priest continually. Now, Dr. Schofield tries to say that it was a priesthood called the Melchizedek priesthood. But I just want to take you on that just for a few minutes. If it was a priesthood, then it had to have a beginning. And it had to have an end. But this had no beginning or had any end. And he did not say he met a priesthood. He met a man. And called his name Melchizedek. He was a person. Not a denomination. Not a a priesthood or fatherhood. He was absolutely a man. By the name of Melchizedek, who was a king of Jerusalem. Not a priesthood. Amen. But a king. Without a father. Priesthoods don't have father. And this man was without father, without mother, without beginning of days or ending of life. Now, the Son of God, 
who this was, this was Jehovah. This was Almighty God Himself. It could be no other. Now, notice, He abideth forever. He has a testimony here that He liveth. He never dies. He never did. He never was nothing else but a lie. He abideth forever. Now, Jesus was made likened unto Him. Now, the reason that there's a difference between God and Jesus, Jesus had a beginning. God had no beginning. Melchizedek had no beginning. And Jesus had a beginning, but Jesus was made likened unto Him. A priest abideth forever. Now, when Melchizedek was on earth, he was nothing in the world but the, the Jehovah God made manifest by creation. He was shared like a theostomy. Abraham met him once in his tent. And as we said this morning, Abraham recognized him. And he told Abraham what he was going to do because he was not going to leave the heir of the world blind to the things that he was going to do. May I stop here for a minute to say God still has the same opinion about His church. Amen. You're not children of darkness. You're children of light. Amen. And uh, we who, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Amen. And would the God who acted to to Abraham, who was to inherit the earth. And he said, I will not keep these things back from the man that's going to inherit the earth. How much more will he reveal his secrets to his church that's going to inherit the earth? Amen. Daniel said, In that day they run to and fro, knowledge shall increase. And he said, The wise shall know their God in that day, Amen. and shall do great exploits in that day. But the wicked will not know the God of heaven. They know Him in a form and in a ritual, like our first lesson said, but they don't know Him by the way of perfection. Amen. And God can only work through perfection because He's perfect. Amen. Blessed be His name. Amen. It has to be a perfect channel that God works through. Because he can do nothing else but work through perfection. He can't stain himself in any way. And then that's why Jesus came to take away our sins that we might be perfected that God could work through his church. Amen. There's where the secret lay. Amen. There's where the world's blind. There's where they want to say that you've lost your mind. Amen. There's where they want to say you don't know what you're talking about. Because the things of the Lord is foolish to the wisdom of this world. But the things of the world is carnal to the believer. Amen. So you're a different person. You're living in a different sphere. You're not no more of this world. You've passed from this life into a new life. Amen. Therefore, God reveals not to the world, not to the psychologists, not to the educated ministers... But to the humble in heart, His people who is meek, He will reveal the secrets of the great things of God to them. Amen. You see it? Praise God. Now, now Abraham was to inherit the world. Through the Abraham seed was all nations to be blessed. So God came down and talked to him in the form of a man. Amen. Now, God has always been on the earth. God has never left the earth. If He'd ever leave the earth, I don't know what that would become of it. But God has always been here in some form. Oh, praise His name. He was with the children in the wilderness of coming out of Egypt in the form of a light. He spoke to Abraham in the form of a man. Amen. He spoke to Moses in the form of a man. Amen. He spoke to the church in the form of a man, His Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. And He's speaking to His church today through the anointed church of the living God. Amen. 
through vessels of clay. Ye are the branches. I am the vine. Amen. God's still speaking. And the world sees Jesus as you present him. That's how the world sees. You are written epistles. Read of all men. Your life tells what you are. Now, this Abraham on his road returning back. We're going to go back and read about him just a few moments. In the book of Genesis. In the 14th chapter of Genesis, I believe it is. Oh, how beautiful the story is here. Now, we all know of Abraham, how that God called him out of the land of Chaldea and the city of Ur, and told him to separate himself from his associates. God calls men or women. He calls a separation. Now, that's what's the trouble with the churches today. They don't want to separate themselves from the old carnal unbelievers. That's why we can't go any further. We just get in that one carnal flow and we we say, Oh, Jim's a good guy if he does drink. If he, and I'll go with him to the pool room, but I don't play pool. I, I, I'll go with her over to the party. They tell dirty jokes and so forth, but I don't tell any. Come out from among them. Amen. That's right. Separate yourself. Touch not their unclean things, and I will receive you, saith the Lord. Be not yoked up with unbelievers, unequally yoked together. Don't you do it. Separate yourself. And God called Abraham to separate himself from all of his kindred. Amen. And to walk with him. Amen. Brother, sometimes it means leaving a church. God. It meant that to Paul, he had to leave his church. Yes. It meant that to many. Sometimes it means to leave home. Amen. Sometimes it means to leave father and mother and forsake all. Amen. I don't mean to say it does every time, but sometimes it does. It means that you've got to take everything between you and God and walk with Him alone. Oh, that blessed, sweet communion. That fellowship that you have when you separate yourselves from the things of the world and the carnal believers who's making fun of you and walk alone with Christ. How many times that I thank God. He said, I'll give you fathers and mothers in this present world. I'll give you friends and associates. I'll never forleave you, neither will I forsake you. Though the whole world turns its back on you, I'll go with you to the end of the way. What a blessed privilege that man has that challenge to follow the Lord Jesus, to separate himself from all his carnal associates, to follow the Lord. And if any person seems not to behave themselves rightly and to present themselves as Christians, but love the carnal things. It's best for you to hunt another partner right away. Yeah. That's right. And if no one will walk with you, there's one who promised to walk with you. Amen. That's the blessed Lord Jesus. Amen. He will walk with you. God told Abraham to separate yourself. And just as human as Abraham was, he took his daddy along. He took his brother's son along, his nephew all hanging on him. And God never did bless him until he did what God Amen. told him to do. Amen. I don't say that you're not a Christian. I, I don't unchristianize anyone. But I'll say this, that if God told you something to do, He'll never bless you until you do it. Amen. I'm in a pulpit tonight with one of those things holding over me. My meetings hasn't been what they should have been. For the past two years, it's because I failed the Lord. Uh, he told me to go to Africa and then to India. Here it is written right here in the back of this book right now. And the manager called me and said, let them Africans go. India's ready. The Holy Spirit met me and said, you'll go to Africa like I told you to. And another year passed and the manager I forgot about it. And he said, we're going to India. Tickets is already here. I started off for God until I got to Lisbon. One night that I thought I was dying. The next morning I started to go over to the bathroom to take a bath. 
Oh, I was so sick I could hardly stand up. There that light hanging there in the bathroom. Said, I thought I told you to go to Africa first. My meetings has been slowly failing since that time. Though I went to India with nearly a half a million standing there. But that wasn't doing what God said to do. And I feel that my meetings will never be a success until I go right straight back and make that thing right. No matter what I do, it's Africa first because you've got to do it. There lays God's eternal word laying there. I knew better than that. But I've got to go back. And I feel that this coming here is the time I'll crawl out of the shell by the help of the Lord. This glorious old gospel who's been growing easy like an oak tree. But I believe she's about ready to spread forth her branches now. I believe it. This great message and great thing. I believe that the Lord let us shake the world again Amen. for the glory of God. Amen. You've got to do what God told you to do. Yeah. And Abraham went right on, took his folks with him. He loved them. That's the human part. But after a while, by and by, his father died and he buried him. Then he had his nephew and then quarrels and arguments come up. And finally, Lot took his choice and went down into Sodom. And you notice Abraham, he didn't fuss with Lot. He said, we are brethren. We must not argue. But you lift up your head and you go any way you want to go. If you go east, I'll go west. If you go north, I'll go south. That's the Christian attitude. Amen. Be willing to give the other man the best of the deal. Amen. Always present it to him. Let him take his choice. For why? Amen. What made Abraham do it? He knew that he was promised by God that he'd inherit the whole thing anyhow. Amen. Amen. So then a tent or a cottage, why should we care? Amen. The whole thing belongs to us. Amen. Blessed are the meat for they shall inherit the earth. Amen. It all belongs to us. God said so. So give the man the best of the choice if he wants to. Maybe that's all he'll ever get. But it all belongs to you. The heirs of salvation by promise. It's all yours. Amen. So Sarah, the most beautiful woman in the land. She sat up there on the hillside with her husband like she should have done. She played, well, might have wore plain calico dresses or what you want to call it. While Miss Lot dressed up like a millionaire and her husband was the mayor of the city. He is a judge that sat in the gate. She had everything and tended all the sewing circles and card parties that there was one on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But Sarah was more pleased to live with her husband on meager fare and know that she was in the will of God yeah. and to enjoy the riches of or the pleasure of riches for a season. That's right. Amen. That's when God visits. One day you just as sure as you take the wrong road, it's going to catch up with you someday. Amen. You might think you'll get all right. You might think you're getting by, but you're not. Amen. It may seem like it's all covered over, but it isn't covered over. God knows everything. Amen. He knows whether you really mean your confession or not. He knows whether you really mean that you believe Him and are saved and accepted Him. And you are dead to the things of the world and you're alive in Christ. He knows that. Amen. Now, we notice Abraham. I want you to notice this real spirit. Oh, the whole blessed thing here is grace. I want you to read with me now from the 14th chapter of Exodus. Just a moment. Now, the first thing taking place, when they got down there, Lot got in trouble. Why? He was out of the will of God. Amen. And if you're getting trouble when you're in the will of God, God will help you out. Yes. But if you're in trouble out of the will of God, there's only one thing to do. Get back in the will of God again. Amen. Now, the kings all drew themselves together and they figured that the plains down there was well watered. And they'd just go down and take this little old Sodom Gomorrah and take it over. And they did. And when they went out and took it over... They took Lot with them. I want you to notice the spirit of Christ here in Abraham. Now notice the 14th verse. 
And when Abraham heard that his brother, get it? His brother was taken captive. He armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Oh, what a blessed thought of grace. Abraham, when his brother, though fallen from grace, though was in this backslidden condition, when he heard that the world had caught him up and had captured him and tucked him away to slaughter him, Abraham acted by the Spirit of Christ. He came and armed all his man that was born in his house and took after them. And pursued him all the way to Dan. And Dan is the uttermost parts of Palestine. Dan to Persheba. From one end to the other. And it's a type of Christ. When he saw that the world had tucked the fallen. That he pursued the enemy to the end. Amen. To receive back the fallen race of Adam. I want you to notice the next verse. How sweet your the Spirit speaks to him. All right. The 15th verse now. And he brought back all. All the goods. And also brought again his brother Lot. And his goods. And the women also. And the people. When Abraham took after the enemy that had took his brother, he pursued him all the way across the nation to Dan and brought back everything that he lost in the fall. Amen. What a beautiful Praise picture of Christ who heard from heaven that we were lost and came and pursued the enemy all the way to hell. Amen. And captured the lost souls and brought us back and restored us to everything that we had before the fall. Amen. We backsliders, we that was born to be sons of God, that perverted into the sons of the devil, and made that went at the things of the world and done wrong and run greedily like Lot did, selling out our birthrights and going at the things of the world. Christ came down, though fallen, God knowing in the beginning who would be saved and who would not. Therefore, come down and pursue the enemy through life, through death, through paradise, into hell. And all the way from glory to hell and tuck over the, the powers of hell and the keys away from the devil and rose again and restored to mankind. That he can be sons and daughters of Praise God again. Yeah. Hallelujah. See the spirit in Abraham there? The spirit of Christ coming with him. Now I want you to notice a little further as we read. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him. After he returned from the slaughter of this king. at Chedora, Clora. And the kings were with him. In the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale, they went out. King of Sodom was brought back. His brother was brought back. The children was brought back. And here went out the kings to meet him. And all oh, so, here's where I want to get to the message now. Watch here. And, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, King of Jerusalem, King of Peace, brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, of the Most High God, possessor of heavens and earth. Melchizedek, the King of Salem, also represented himself. Among the other kings. And notice. The battle was over. The spirit of God in Abraham. Of Christ. That had brought back his fallen brother. 
Man restored him back to his rightful condition. To all that he had lost. He had brought it back. And when he did, he brought out bread and wine. The communion. Can't you see who that Melchizedek was? It was God. Brought out the communion after the battle. Now let's turn again to Matthew 26, 26 right quick and see what Jesus said here about that. In the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, and also the 26th verse, we want to read just a little bit here. All right. Matthew 26, 26. Then come with Jesus with them into a place called Golgotha. Golgotha, or Gethsemane, I mean, and said unto his disciples, Set ye where while I go yonder to pray. I believe I've got the wrong scripture. Matthew, the 20, 26 verse of the 26th chapter. If somebody has it, read it for me. If you, you can find it. Just a minute. This is a beautiful type here. And I don't want you to miss it. Here we are. That's got his sister. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. What was it? The battle was over. Amen. Break it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. See that Melchizedek hundreds of years before? When he met Abraham after the battle was over, he gave bread and wine. And here Jesus gives the disciples after his hard battle was over, he gave them bread and wine. Watch. Watch the future coming. And he took the cup and, and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for sins and remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We are in the battle now. We're after our fallen brother. That God before the foundation of the world saw and predestinated unto eternal life. And the things of the world got him caught up in a whirlwind. He's out into societies and classes, him and his wife, walking up and down the streets, smoking and drinking and crousing, trying to find peace. And the Spirit of Christ in us, as it would be in Abraham, we're gone after him. With all the armors of God, the angels of God encamped about. We're gone to bring back our fallen brother. And when the battle is finally ended, we will meet Melchizedek again. Bless God who blessed Abraham there and gave him the blessing and gave him bread and wine, the communion. And when the battle's over, we'll meet him we who are the heirs of the promise of Abraham, joint heirs with Christ in the kingdom, shall meet him at the end of the road and take bread and wine again. Amen. When the battle's over, Amen. who is this Melchizedek? The one that had no father, had no mother, had no beginning of days or the ending of life. He'll be there to give the communion again. Amen. You get it? When we pull up on a certain nights, when we come together and take communion from the hands of the ministers, representing that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, that that veil, His body, that He was unveiled in God, we take it as a representative. We're dead to the things of the world and been born anew of the Spirit. And we walk with the body of Christ, all the believers together. When the great battle is finished and we come up again with Christ, We'll take the communion with him in the kingdom of God anew and eat the flesh and drink the blood of the grape again. 
in the kingdom of God. Oh, there's Melchizedek. That's who he was. Now let's read just a little further about him here. And the 18th verse, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. You get it? And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and says, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heavens and earth. And he blessed him. And he blessed and blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. He paid tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham give him a tenth of the spoils. Now I want you to notice here, as Paul goes on, giving a background for the coming lesson now. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take thou the goods to thyself. Now the king of Sodom said, Now you just give me back my subjects and you take the goods to yourself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, Elohim, the possessor of heavens and earth there. Most High God, the possessor of heavens and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latch. He didn't have a great campaign to take up money. He only wanted his fallen brother. And that I will not take anything of thine, lest thou shalt say, I have made Abraham rich, save only that which the young man have eaten, and the potion of the man which went with me. Now, I want you to notice, Abraham said, I'll not take from a thread to a shoe latch. He didn't fight the war. To make a lot of money. And real true battles. Are not made with selfish motives. Wars are not fought for money. Wars are fought for. For motives. For principles. Man fight war. Uh, for principles. And when Abraham went out. To get Lot. He didn't go out because he knew he could whip the king's. And take all their possession. He went out for the principle of saving his brother. Amen. And any minister that sat out under the inspiration of the king of heaven will not go for money. Amen. Neither will he go to make big churches. Neither will he go to inspire denominations. He will only go for one principle. And that is to bring back his fallen brother. Whether he gets a dime in the offering or whether he doesn't, it won't make a bit of difference to him. If I say real wars are fought and waged for principles and not for money. And men and women who join church and come into church to be popular because the Joneses belong there. Or they change their church from a little church to a big church. You're doing it for a selfish motive and the right principle is not behind it. You should be willing to stand at the battlefront. In this tabernacle here, when things go wrong, and you men and you women are running to go over somewhere else or lay out till the little fuss of the stew is over, there's something wrong with your experience. Right. We have a custom here. We have, a, we have an order here. This church is based upon the principles of the Bible. If there's somebody in here not doing right, you think you're not, you go to him and talk to him. If you can't reconcile him, then take some brother with you. One or two more. If he won't be reconciled then, then tell it to the church. And the church will dismiss him. Have no more fellowship with him. And Jesus said, whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. That's the reason you have so much troubles. Because you don't follow the Bible principles. Amen. If somebody in the church is causing a disturbance, or something going wrong. It's not your duty to go talk about that man or that woman. It's your duty to go to that man or woman. And tell him his error. 
And if he won't hear you, take some other one with you. If he won't hear that, then the church loses him. Jesus said, what you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. What you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. That's the power of the church. You're not all go a good preacher friend of mine. He had a boy. And that boy had been going to church, his own church. He got to a place where he started running around with a little old girl who smoked and drank and carried on. Preacher said, of course, that's his business. A very bosom friend of mine and a nice boy. But he got all infatuated with some young woman. And she'd been married, had some children. Her husband is living. He's afraid he's going to have that boy would marry her. So the brother was all tore up. And he said to me, Brother Branham, I want you to go to this certain, certain boy of mine. I want you to talk to him. I said, Brother, I almost called his name. You have a better way. Don't send me. If the boy is not living up and the church has saw him doing wrong, then it's a thing for the church to do this business. That's left with the church. And the church goes over and tells him. So he took a brother and went over and told him. And he got back at the brother. Let him know he was tending to his own business. For him to do the same. He took another brother. Two more. Two deacons. Went over and told the boy. He wouldn't listen to it. They told it to the church. And he'd never come for several nights to be reconciled to the church after his sin was told before the church. Then the church loosed him. And about a month from then, he was stricken down with pneumonia. And the doctor said, there's not a chance in the world for him to live. Then he crawled back. God knows how to do it. We try to do it in ourselves. Oh, you're kick so-and-so out of church. You're do this, that, and the other. Have you done your part as a church towards it? There you are. That's the way to make them crawl back. Turn them over to the devil one time. What Paul said about this man down there was living with his stepmother. They couldn't get him reconciled. said, so turn him over to the devil. Watch what happens. And in the next letter Paul wrote, this man had got straightened out. <laughs> sure, God has a way of doing these things. If we'll just follow his rules. If something goes wrong in the church, if it's amongst the congregation, each one of your brothers, put on the deacon board, one of you deacons, don't behave. The other deacons, come and have a meeting. Try to reconcile, brother. Tell him what he's doing. Or one of you members, whatever you are. Then it's to be brought before me. If won't do it, then come tell the pastor. Then he's loose from the church and then let him be as a heathen and a publican. Then watch the Lord go to work on him. See? That's when he comes back to himself. That's when he goes to crawling in. But we try to do it ourselves. You know, try to do the, everything the way we should do it. Now, we never make a success. Now, this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of, priest of the Most High, met Abraham and blessed him and gave him this tithings. Abraham did, and he was the king of Salem, and he brought out bread and wine, the communion, and gave it to Abraham after the battle, after the man had been won over. Now, all wars, as I say, are fought for principles. Now, if you have a little war in church, it must be the right principle. You must be fighting for the right thing. And each member of the church is supposed to do that. Now, this teaching is for the church. That's what we're here for. That's what I'm standing here for. That's what God's Word's for. It's for the church. Don't never let nothing hinder this church. If it does, you're guilty. Each one of you. And you and your different churches. If something's going wrong in your church, you're guilty because you're the overseer of that church. It ain't up to the pastor. It ain't up to the deacon board. It's up to you. You individual. To go to that brother and see if you can have him reconciled. If not... Then take two or three with you. Then come back. You won't hear that? Tell it to the church. Then he's dismissed from the kingdom of God. God said, if you dismiss him there, I'll dismiss him here. If you went through this order, then he'll turn the devil loose to him for the construction, destruction of his flesh. And then he'll come back. That's right. That's the way to make him come back. If he's a child of God, he will come back. If he isn't, well, well he'll go on. And then the devil will send him on to his eternal place. Now, the motives of it. If you just get it in for somebody, then that's different. But if the man is guilty and Lot had went down and had backslid, though he was a Hebrew, he went down and was backslid. He was in grace, but he had fallen from it. And when he went out and Lot, Lot was saved, don't never think it. Lot wasn't saved. He was because all the time when he was in the wrong place, the Bible said 
that the sins of Sodom vexed his righteous soul daily. Amen. Now his flesh was doing one thing. And what was his end? He would have brought more disgrace. His wife turned to a pillar of salt. He had children by his daughters. So you can see what a disgrace it brought. Because he had fallen from grace and never restored himself back again. And God had to take him out of the earth. But still he was a fallen brother. And Abraham done all that he could do to bring him back again. And the spirit was in Abraham is the spirit of Christ. That's in the church today. No matter what the brother's done. You'll do all you can to bring him back into the fellowship of Christ again. No matter what he's done. You'll try hard. Now. We want to notice here now again, as we go on with this lesson of this male, Kesedic, this great priest of Salem and the possessor of heavens and earth, now being first without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor ending of life, but was made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Now watch. He wasn't the Son of God. He was the God of the Son. He wasn't the son of God, Melchizedek wasn't, but he was the father of the son of God. Now this body that he had, he had created. It had not been brought to a woman. So with that created body, he could not, somebody had made himself to reveal himself. No man can see God at any time. God is a spirit. Mortal eyes doesn't see those things. Unless it's in the form like the pillar of fire or whatever it was, or in the form of some being that they seen by vision but the God has to reveal himself through some way and God revealed himself to Abraham in the form of a man he revealed himself to Moses in the form of a man he revealed himself to the children of Israel in the form of a pillar of fire he revealed himself unto John the Baptist in the form of a dove you see he revealed himself in those forms when he was revealing himself in the form of a man as the king of Salem, of Jerusalem. Not of the earthly Jerusalem, but the heavenly Jerusalem. He revealed himself in that form. He was made like unto the Son of God. Now the Son of God had to come to a woman to be created here by the, the womb of a woman. Because through that same thing come death. And he could not come through creation like God did at the beginning. When God made man at the beginning, woman had nothing to do with it. God just said, let there be. And a man came from the dust. He called him without any woman to have anything to do with it. But the woman at then was in the man. And God took the woman out of Adam's side. Is that right? And then woman went and brought man through sex. So the only way that God could do, he couldn't come in that theosomy. He couldn't come as Melchizedek. He had to come as a man and he had to come to the woman. Thy seed shall bruise the serpent's head. And his head will bruise your heel. Get it? God had to come to a woman. And he did when he dwelt in his body of his son, Christ Jesus. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And he offered his own blood as a sacrifice and gave his life that through that channel of death, he might save you into eternal life. So God came in and he was made like unto the Son of God. Amen. See, he was a man made like the Son of God. Now, he couldn't be the Son of God because this man is eternal. The Son of God had a beginning. He had an end. He had a, a time of his birth. He had a time of his death. He had both beginning and end. He had both father and mother. This man had neither father nor mother, beginning or end of time. But he was made, this man, Melchizedek, was made like the Son of God. Now the Son of God, when he was coming to the world in the form of a woman, or through a woman, in man's form, and was killed, raised up again, on the third day rose for our justification, now he abides forever. And as long as that body abides, we abide too. And because he raised up from the dirt, we'll be raised up in his likeness. Amen. 
There's the gospel story. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Not angels, not supernatural beings, not a bunch of feathers to flop around, but men and women. Amen. 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 Amen is like this. Yes, sir. As I've often told this, I say it again, at this time it seems suitable. I was combing about this five or six hairs that I have left. And my wife said, Billy, you're getting bald-headed. I said, but I haven't lost one of them. She said, where are they at? I said, tell me where they was before I got them. I'll tell you where they are waiting for me. <laughs> That's right. I used to be a, a fighter, pugilist. I was strong and big. And I felt if you set this church on my back and walk down the street with it. I'll tell you, when I get up in the morning now, I realize it's 40-something years has passed. See? I'm not what I used to be. I'm failing every day. As I look at my hands and think, look here. Well, I'm getting an old man. I look at my shoulders. I see I've gained a lot of weight. I used to wear a 28 on a belt to wear a 30 now. See, I'm getting old, fat, dwindling away. What is it? I eat the same thing I used to eat. I live cleaner and better than I used to live. The same thing, but God has appointed a time for me. And I must receive it. But the blessed thought is that that day he'll raise me up again. Amen. And everything that I was when I was 25 years old, I'll be again forever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. There you are. Hallelujah. What does old age bother me? Amen. I beat the devil out of that for years and years. Amen. Knowing this, that I believe him. Amen. This little spans, it's a little short thing anyhow. If we only stay three score and ten. Seventy years old, our promised time. What, what's that but misery and sorrow? What is it? Would you swap this past house for that glorious thing yonder? Why, well, blessed be the name of the Lord. Something on the inside of me met that Melchizedek one day. Amen. And he spoke peace to me and he gave me eternal life. And this life means nothing but a tabernacle to preach the gospel through. Amen. I say this with all sincerity. These two Bibles ain't open before me. If my God was through with me preaching the gospel and I could do the more for him, my children was old enough to take care of themselves. If he wants to take me right now, amen. Amen. That settles it. Yes, sir. What difference does it make if I'm 80 or if I'm 20? I'm only here for one thing, to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's all. If I can still preach the gospel like I do now when I'm 80, what difference does it make for them 40 or 80? Amen. There's a many man 80 years old tonight. There's a lot of children will die. Well, that 80 year old man will outlive them, any one of them. What difference does it make? It's your motives, your principles. And we're here to serve the Lord Jesus. Amen. That's all knowing this to this life is a vapor that a man speaks about that once was and then is not. But if we have eternal life, God's promise, He'll raise us up again and we'll take the communion with Him when the days are over and we say, Enter into the Joys of the Lord has been prepared for you Amen. since the foundation of the world. Then what difference does it make here whether we have anything or whether we don't? Amen. Whether we're young or whether we're old. Amen. What difference does it make? The main thing, are you ready to meet Amen. Him? Amen. Do you love Him? Can you serve Him? Amen. Have you sold out to the things of the world? Amen. Have you met Melchizedek Amen. since the battle was over? Amen. Bless God, about 21 Amen. years Old I was, and one day I had a battle with this, that, and the other. I couldn't make out whether I want to be a fighter, whether I want to be a trapper or a hunter, what I want to be, but I met Melchizedek. Amen. And he gave me communion, and since then it was Amen. settled forever. Praise God. Hallelujah. I went on his side. I've been rejoicing on the road. And when it comes to the end of the road, and death stares me in the face, the way I feel now, I'll never dread it. I won't want to walk into the face of it knowing this, that I know Him who has made the promise. Amen. That's right, that I know Him in the power of His resurrection. When He calls from among the dead, I'll come out from among them. Amen. That's right, knowing Him in the power of His resurrection. What difference does it make whether I'm old or whether I'm young? Whether I'm little or whether I'm big? Amen. Whether I'm full or whether I'm hungry? Whether I've got a place laid out or whether I haven't? The birds has the nest and the fox has the end. But the Son of Man has not a place to lay his head. But he was the King of glory. Amen. We are kings and priests tonight. What difference does it make whether we have or whether we haven't? Amen. As long as we got God, we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. 
We sat in the presence of God, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Amen. taking spiritual communion from the hands of Him that testified. I was He that was dead and alive again, and I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Setting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, blessed be His holy name. What difference does it make? A tenor cottage, why should I care? Amen. They're building a palace for me over there. Yeah. Bob rubies and diamonds and Amen. silver and gold. Yeah, His coffers are full. He has riches untold. Yeah. I met him one day when I come from the battle. Yeah. I laid my trophies down. I ain't fought a battle since then. Amen. He fights them for me. I just rest upon his promise knowing this, that I know him and the power of his resurrection. That's all that matters. What else does matter? What can we do? Why take and thought can add one cubic to your statue? What do you care whether your hair is curly or whether you got any or not? What Amen. difference does it make? If you're old, if you're gray, if you're stoop shouldered, if you're not, what difference does it make? Amen. 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 This is just for a spell. Yeah. A little space, but that's forever and forever. And as aeons of time roll on, as the ages roll on, you'll never change in this through these ceaseless eternal ages. What difference does it make? I'm so glad I met him. I'm so glad he gave me communion one day. That same Melchizedek that met Abraham coming from the slaughter of the kings. Certainly. The God of heaven, the Elohim, the great I am, not the I was, I am. <laughs> Present tense. And he blessed him. Listen here just a little further so we can get the lesson a little closer together. Now the fourth verse. Now consider how great this man was. <laughs> I just think that too. Consider how great this man was. He's beyond the Son of God. The Son of God had father and mother. He didn't. The Son of God had a beginning of time and an ending of time. He didn't. Who was that? That was the father of the son. Amen. That's who it was. Consider how great this man was. Unto even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of all the spoils. Now listen closely. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have commandment to take tithings of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. Watch this if you want to see something. But he whose descent is not contended, for from then receiveth tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promise. Abraham had the promise, and this man blessed Abraham who had the promise. Who was this? Amen. The sons of Levi paid tithes to their brethren, or their brethren paid tithes to them. They had a commandment of the Lord to take a tenth of what their brothers made for their living because they were the priesthood. Now that lets out the Melchizedek priesthood as you talk about right there. Amen. That's right. But this man, even the one who had the promise, the greatest man on earth, Abraham, Amen. met this man and paid tithes to him. He had to be greater. Amen. Listen. And without any contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Certainly. Amen. Watch who he is. And here, man that die receive tithes. That's the priesthood of the order of priests and preachers and so forth. Man that receive tithes die. See? But here, he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. What would a man take tithings for if he had he if he never was born and never will die and was from beginning to end and, and never had no father or mother descent and owned the whole heavens and earth and all with it? Why would he take tithes? Why would he ask Abraham to pay tithes? You see what a strict thing it is to pay tithes? Tithing's right. Every Christian's duty bound to pay tithes. It's right. Never has been changed. Now, and as I may so say, Levi also who received tithe paid tithes in Abraham. Now, here's something. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. What? Levi, Abraham, was Levi's great, great grandpa. 
And the Bible said here that Levi paid tithes when he was in the loins of Abraham. Four generations before he ever come to earth, he was paying tithes to Melchizedek. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then you that can't believe in predestination, before ordination. Amen. And here, four generations before Levi would ever come out of the loins of Abraham was paying tithes to Melchizedek. Amen. Wish we had time to run this through the Scripture. If you take it over to like a Jeremiah 1 and 4. God said, I knew you before you was even formed in your mother's womb. And I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Amen. Then what can you say that you did? What can I say that I did? It's God that showeth mercy. Amen. God knew us before the foundation of the world. He's not willing that any should perish. Certainly not. But if he's God, he knew who would be saved and who wouldn't be saved. Or he didn't know anything. Amen. If he didn't know, if he didn't know who would make the rapture before the world was ever formed, then he's not God. Amen. If he's infant, he, he know every flea, every fly, every louse, every chigger Amen. that would ever be on the earth before the earth was ever formed. Amen. That's right. He knew all things. Before the foundation of the world, he knew us. The Bible said that he knew us and predestinated us. Amen. Let's settle this just once. Let's go back to Ephesians, the first chapter, the fifth chapter, the first chapter of Ephesians, just a moment. I want to read here just a minute so that you can really understand that it's not just something I'm trying to tell you. It's something God's trying to tell you. See? Now listen to this real close. First chapter of Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, the same man who wrote the Hebrew letter, is writing this letter. To the saints, this is not to the unbelievers, but to the saints, the sancti sainted ones, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as He, now listen close now, the fourth verse, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Who's the us there? The church. Amen. He chose us in Him, Christ, before the foundation of the earth, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to His own good pleasure of His will. Who did it? God did it. Amen. God knowed from the beginning who would be saved and who wouldn't be saved. Amen. Certainly he was not willing for any to perish. But he didn't send Jesus here just to see if you'd, you'd act like, well, poor Jesus, I feel sorry for him. Maybe I better get saved and prove it. No, sir. God knowed in the beginning who would and who would not. So therefore he knew that some would, so he sent Jesus to make a propitiation for those that he foreknew. For those who he foreknew, he has called. And those who he has called, he has justified. And those who he has justified, he hath past tense glorified. Amen. There you are. So it's not you that keeps yourself, it's the grace of God that keeps you. You didn't save yourself for nothing you've done to deserve being saved. It's God's grace that saved you. Amen. God's grace called you. God's foreknowledge knew you. He knew that you'd be in this church this night before the foundation of the world was ever laid. If he's infant, if he isn't, he isn't God. If he did know all things, he was God. If he didn't know all things, he wasn't God. Amen. If he's almighty God, he can do all things. If he cannot do all things, he's not almighty God. Amen. There you are. So how can you say it's something you could do? It's nothing you can do. It's God's loving grace to you that you're even here. Nothing you can do. God calls you by His grace. You listen, heard, accept it. Well, you say, Brother Branham, that makes it awful loose. Certainly it does. You're free. Well, that fellow can do anything he wants to. Absolutely. I always do what I want to do. But if you're a Christian, you don't want to do wrong. 
There's a little old girl sitting back there tonight, my wife. I love her with all that's in me. And if I know that I could run around with another woman and get by with it and go tell her and say, Media, I did wrong. Do you think I'd do it? If I love her right, I won't do it. That's right. Now, what if I say, oh, I can't do it because I tell you why. She divorced me and I got, oh, I'm a preacher. See what they do? They take me out of the pulpit and she divorced me, divorced me. And oh, I got three children. I couldn't think of that. But boy, I th- well, if that's the way it is, you're still legal. It's not legal basis that I married her up on. It's not legal basis that makes me live true to her. It's because I love her. That's right. Yeah. Praise God. I don't have to do anything. I do it willfully because it's a love affair. Emma. And if you love your wife, you'll do the same thing. Yeah. And if you love your wife like that, with filial love, what ought you to do to Christ with agape love? Which is a million times stronger. Emma. If you really love God, if I know tonight I could go out and get a little drunk. If I know tonight I could run around and be immoral. If I know tonight that's even in my heart to do so. And I went and let it go and he'd forgive me. I wouldn't do it. I think too much of him. I love him. Sure. Certainly, that's the reason I wouldn't sell my experience to any denomination. No, sir. No Assemblies of God, no Church of God, no Pilgrim Holiness, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic. I wouldn't take anything that could be offered for this experience. Because it never come by man, it come by God. No, sir, I wouldn't sell my birthrights for any Elvis Presley's rock and roll. Amen. Or for his fleet of Catholics or his, uh, Cadillacs or his million dollars and so forth he gets each month. Amen. No, sir, I love him. Amen. And if I, as long as I love him like that, I'll stay true to him. Amen. And if God's called me and elected me, he's placed something in me. And I love him. I remember Mr. Iser. You all know him, most all of you. He's come right here, state senator of Indiana, come here, play his guitar. And my baby had died, and wife had died, and all of them laying up here in the graveyard, and I was going up the road with my hands behind me, crying. He jumped out of his little old truck and come put his arm around me. He said, Billy, I want to ask you a question. I said, I've heard you preach to you, you'd almost fall in the pulpit. Heard you on the street corners and everything, crying out for Christ. So said, now he took your daddy, he took your brother, snatched them both and they died in your arms. There he died, your wife died holding your hands. And your baby died and you calling on him to help you. And he turned his back on you. What do you think about him? I said, I love him with all that's within me. Amen. If he sends me to hell, I'll still love him. He just, I don't say that. 26 years has proved it. That's right. If you love him, not a duty that I can't do this and I can't do that. You love him too much to do it. Amen. Because he has chosen you. You never chose him. He chose you. Amen. You said, I sought the Lord and sought the Lord. No man seeks God. It's God seeking man. Amen. You might be seeking a favor of him. But God has to change your nature before you can even seek after him. Because you're a sinner. You're a pig. That's right. Some of you people going to church and just living by your membership. Go out here and do everything of the world and then still go back and say, Yeah, I belong to the church. Well, that's a long ways in belonging to God. Amen. Certainly. I don't. But you see people doing that, you can tell, Oh, they're good church members. That's true. You can still be a church member and do those things. But you can't be a Christian in doing them. Amen. As I said this morning, the old crow. If there was a hypocrite, it's a crow. That's right. Him and the dove sat on the same ark, sat in the same roost. And the old crow was satisfied when he was turned loose and got out of that church that he could go out there and sit on one old dead carcass and caw, caw, and eat off of this one, eat off the horse, eat off the cow, and whatever it was, he was satisfied. But when Noah turned the dove loose, she could find no rest for the soles of her feet. She had just as much right to sit on a dead animal as a crow did. But it was two different natures. One of them, she was a dove to begin with. He was a crow to begin with. But if you notice, the old crow can sit over here on a dead carcass and eat half the day. The dove will sit in a wheat field and eat half the day. And the crow can fly right out there and eat dove food as much as he wants to. He can eat just as much uh, wheat as the crow can, or as the dove can. But he, the crow can eat the dove food... But the dove can't eat crow food. Amen. That's right. 
so old hypocrite can come to church and rejoice and shout and praise the Lord and go on like that and go right back out and enjoy the things of the world. But a born-again Christian cannot do it because the love of God constrains him to such a place he can't do it. So if you're just a Christian by joining the church and quitting doing this and that and the same desires in you, you need another dip. That's exactly right. And you women who can dress with them little old shorts and ride here on the street and then call yourself a believer. You're a believer, but you're a poor example of one, maybe. If you really had Christ in your heart, you wouldn't have to think about such things as that. I don't care what the rest of women does and the rest of girls do. You'd be different because you love Christ too much. I talked to a woman the other day in the house and she threw her hands up like this. She said, Reverend Branham, I'm almost naked here in my house. I'm walking around. I thought, shame on you. In your own house, I don't care where you are. That's right. Dress and act like a woman, like a lady. Ought to. Shame on you. But you keep, the Bible said, if you love those things, the things of the world, the love of Christ is not even in you. If you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you'll keep them little dirty, nasty things off of you. That's right. And you deacon and you others here that run out on the street here and gawking your neck and looking at every one of them women. Shame on you and calling yourself sons of God. I know that's scorching, but uh, brother, be scorched and then burnt forever. Uh, so if you do those things, uh, you can't help it. If a woman walks down the street half dressed, you, if you're looking, you're bound to see her, but you can turn your head. The Bible says, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in heart. Let me tell you something, sister dear. You're going to answer, I don't care, you might be as pure as a lily. You may never actually committed a sin of that type, an immoral sin in your life. But if you dress like that, you're going to answer the judgment for committing adultery with every man that looked at you. Amen. The Bible said. Amen. Walk down the street. Who's guilty? The man? No, sir, you are. You presented yourself that way. The woman's got a great place. It's a sacred place. Nice, wonderful place. But she must keep herself that way to hold her office as she should as a mother, as a woman. And a womanhood, when the womanhood's broke, a backbone of any nation's broke. That's the reason it, our nation is ruined. It's because of the immorals of our women. Uh, That's exactly right. Sure. It's the rottenness among us what's breaking it. What you need is to meet this Melchizedek one time. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let him... Let Him bless you and give you the wine and the bread, eternal life. Then you'll see things different. Then you'll, it'll be different. You won't want the boys to be making a the coyote whistle at you, the wolf whistle or whatever you want to call it. Certainly not. You'll be different. And you mean to tell me that you dress like that and get out there for any other purpose? You say, well, it's cooler. You're storytelling. It is not cooler. Science proves that it's not cooler. It's a, it's a lust that's come up on you, sister. You don't realize it. I'm not trying to hurt you, but I'm trying to warn you. A many a moral woman, just as clean as she can be, a nice little lady, walk out with them things on the street, unconscious of knowing what she's doing. Because some backslidden preacher is afraid your husband won't pay his tithes in the church anymore. If he'd ever met Melchizedek, he wouldn't think those things. He'd preach the gospel of his sports to hide off their back. He'd preach it anyhow. The doctor right. You do it, and you do it because of the spirit of lust that's up. And you, man, that let your wives do those kind of things, I've got little hopes of you as a man. Yes. That's right. That's right. Now, there's no compliments on that because there's no apology because that's true. Any man that'll let his wife get out on the street and act like that, brother, you ought to be wearing her clothes. That's right. You, why, my, I don't say my wife won't do it. But I have to be changed and perverted to what I am now if I ever live with her while she's doing it. And that's exactly right. My girls, they may do it. When they get to be women, I don't say they won't. I don't know. That's up the mercy of God. I hope they don't. If they do, they'll walk over the prayers of a righteous father. Amen. They'll walk over the life of somebody who tries to live right if they ever do it. That's right. Well, I want to live right, teach right, be right, and instruct them right. If they do that, they'll beat their way to hell over the top of my preaching, over the top of my Christ, and over the top of my warnings. That's right, if they ever do it. Certainly, that's right. Shame on you. If you ever meet Christ face to face, and He blesses you, and puts that kiss of approval on your heart, all devils in hell will never make you put them on again. That's right. You've changed from death into life. And your affections are set on things above and not on the things of the earth. 
Amen. I better leave that subject. It's ticklish. All right. But it's the truth. All right, as we go on now, just a little further, and then we're closing. Verily they that are of the sons of Levi receive tithe of the office of the priesthood and have a commandment to take tithe of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them that received tithes of Abraham and blessed of him that had the promise. And with all contradictions, the less is blessed of the better. And here man that die receive tithes, but here he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And I, and as I may say, Levi also received tithes, received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Your, your attitude towards Christ will make a great impression on what your children will be. Your life that you live before your family will make an impression on what your children will be. Because the Bible said that he had visited the iniquity of the parents upon the children to the third and fourth generations. Now, just a few moments before closing. And therefore, if perfection, there's your perfection again, were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what farther need that there come another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron, the law, the legalist. See? Oh, you have to do this. If you don't do this, you're not a Christian. If you don't keep the Sabbath, if you don't, if you eat meat, if you do these things, all these legal ideas, and you've got to go to church. If you don't, you pay a penalty for it. You have to do an obenia. That stuff is nonsense. You're saved by the grace of God, by the foreknowledge of God, by His predestination. God called Abraham by predestination, by foreknowledge. He called, he hated Esau and loved Jacob before either one was born. That's right. It's, it's God's foreknowledge that knows these things. You say, then what's use of preaching the gospel? Now, I'll say to you this. Paul answered that. Or Jesus did, rather. Here's Jesus. He said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that went to this a, a pond or a lake and threw it in a net. He pulled in. Out of there, he had turtles. He had terrapins. He had serpents. He had lizards. He had frogs. He had spiders. He had scavengers. He had, he had fish. Now, the man just saying him. That's like the gospel. Here it is now. I'm preaching the gospel. I just throw the net out. I pull it. I say, all that will, whosoever, let him come. Here comes some at the altar. They all hang around the altar. They pray. They cry. I don't know one from the other. It's not my business. I wasn't sent to judge. But there's some in there that's frogs. There's some that's lizards. There's some that's snakes. There's some that's turtles. And there's some that's fish. It's not my business to judge. I say, Father, here's what I pulled out. But the frog was a frog to begin with. The spider, the old spider will sit there and look around a little while, wall and big eyes, look around and say, you know what? I just about got as much of this as I can stand. Plop, 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 plop. Out they go. Old lady surfing will raise her head up and say, well, you know what? If they go to preach like that against wearing shorts and things, that takes me. So I'll get away with that bunch of holy roars. That's all it was it. You was a snake to start with. That's exactly right. Yeah. And here sits old Mr. Toad Frog with that great big cigar in his mouth like a dehorned Texas steer. I'll stand there and look around and say, Well, and everybody can give me this hope. I'll just get out of this thing right now. Well, you old frog, you was that to begin with. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Your nature proves what you are. Your life shows, reflects what you are. And in the beginning, it's not hard for me to see that. It's not hard for you to see it. If I went out to Roy Slaughter's, a farmer sitting here, and I saw the pigs out on manure pile eating manure, I wouldn't think nothing bad about that. He's a pig. But if I saw a lamb up on that manure pile, I'd wonder. <laughs> see? Don't worry, you won't see him there. He just couldn't stand it. <laughs> That's right. And a man that's born of the Spirit of God hates the things of the world. Yeah, that's right. For if you love the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. Amen. If I run around with women every day and come and tell my wife I love her, she'd know I was a liar. 
My actions will speak louder than my words. Certainly. I proved to her I didn't love her because it wasn't true to her. She told me she loved me and every time I'd be gone, she'd take over somebody else. It would prove that she didn't love me. Right. Her actions proved. I don't care how much she'd try to tell me, Bill, I love you and there's no one else in the world but you. I know she's a liar. And when you try to say, Lord, I love you and doing the things of the world, God knows you're a liar to begin with. So why, what's the use except an old halfway experience and something like that when the great skies of heaven are full of the real thing? Why do you want to be a miserable, professed, halfway, half-baked, so-called Christian when you can be a real born-again child of God with the joy bells of heaven ringing in your heart, rejoicing and praising God and living a life of victory through Jesus Christ? Not trying to do it yourself because you have failed to begin with, but take Him as His Word. And rest upon what he said was the truth. And believe him and love him. And he'll make everything work right and right for you. That's it. That's the idea. The Lord bless you. Don't want to scold you. But brother, it's best to get a little scolding. You're my young'uns. You see? And any papa that loves his kids will certainly correct them. He's not the right kind of a papa. Is that right? That's right. And this papa only has one rule. And that's the rule of the home. And God only has one rule. And that's his word. If we believe His Word, then we live by His Word. It's our duty. If we've ever met God, not because you say, Well, I go to church and I've got to do this. You're miserable. Don't do that. Why do you want to be a miserable, decrepit, ungodly crow for? Well, you can be a dove. Certainly. You just have to have your nature changed. And you change your nature and become a son and daughter of God. Be at peace with God. Amen. Jesus, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffer without the gates. Hebrews 13, 12 and 13. Amen. Romans 5, 1. Therefore being justified by faith, not by shaking hands, not by water baptism, not by laying out of hands, not by shouting, not by speaking in tongues, not with any sensation, but being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We yeah. pass from death unto life and become new creatures because we have believed on the only begotten Son of God and accepted Him as our personal Savior. And His blood acts tonight as a propitiation for our sin to stand in the place. In the Old Testament, there's only one place to have fellowship. That's under the blood. Yeah. Every believer had to come under the blood. When the red heifer was killed, she was made for a sin offering. She must be read. And 19th chapter of Exodus, if any of you like to read it. And she must be taken hoof all, burnt together. And then that was made a water of separation. It was set without the gates. It had to be handled with clean hand. The blood of this heifer went before to the congregation and stroked seven times up over the door. And now every defiled person walking up must first recognize and see that blood and realize that there's only fellowship beneath that blood. That's the only place the worshiper that could actually worship officially was under the blood. Then the first thing he had to do before he could come under the blood, there had to be this water of separation sprinkled up on him. And the uncleanness was made clean. And to took the water of separation and sprinkle it up on the wayfaring man and separate him from his sins. And then he walked under these seven stripes of blood and had fellowship with the rest of the believers in the presence of God. There's only one way to do it, not shaking hands, not joining church, not by baptisms, not by emotions, but walk up to the waters of separation. Lay your hands by faith upon the head of Jesus and say, I'm a sinner and you died in my place. And something in me tells me that you'll forgive me of my sins and I accept you as my personal Savior. Now walk beneath the blood down and have fellowship with the children of God. Amen. That's it. Eat the bread, drink the wine, and have the fellowship with the church. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Isn't he good? Now, this may seem strange to you, friend, but what, what do I stand here and say these things for? Would I say them to try to make myself different from somebody else? If I do, then I need to repent. I'm saying it because God said it. Because it's God's Word. And listen, there's coming a time, and now is, that when people are going from the east to the west trying to find the Word of God and can't find it. Amen. When you go into a meeting, the first thing you do you go in there and they have a bunch of tongues and interpretations. And somebody raise up and keep quoting the scripture. And that's carnal. Amen. Absolutely. God said for us not to use vain repetitions. What about him? If he's wrote it once, you believe it. He don't have to say it again. Tongues and interpretations is right, but it's be a direct message to the church or to somebody. 
Not just carnal and things like that. And then you get ahead and all these other things. Sure, the other day, uh, two men walked into a, a man and a wife and another man and a wife, just young married, walked into a place to go to Africa as missionary. Somebody stood up and gave a prophecy and gave tongues and interpretations that they had each other's wife. That it should not be that way. They married the wrong person. And those two people separated and remarried over again. One man took the other's wife, the other in a leading Pentecostal uh, denomination. And went to Africa as missionary. Oh, yeah. Brother, when you take your oath, your duty bound to that oath, till death sets you free. Amen. Exactly right. Certainly when you take your oath, it's binding. All those nonsense. And it's got to a place that when you go to the churches, it's either so cold and formal and dry to the spiritual thermometer will go 50 below zero. The people set this like a ward on a pickle. Just as sour and indifferent and puckered up. Amen. And if you hear somebody way back in a corner might groan out a little, hey, man, what's why I can hurt them. All of them will stretch their neck like geese to look around and see what took place. You know that's the truth. I'm not saying that for a joke. This is no place to joke. That's the truth. Right. I'm saying it because it's a gospel truth. And the other side, you get a bunch of nonsense of a bunch of fleshly emotions carrying on. And the true word of God finally has got to a place where you can seldom hear it. The old middle of the road, the gospel, the light to my path. Hallelujah. The blood of Lamb, the love of God that separates us from the things of the world. Have you spoken yeah. tongues, brother? You haven't got it. Did you shout with a cold feeling up your back? Did you see balls of fire? Oh, nonsense. Yeah. No such a thing. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and accepted Him as your personal Savior? And the Spirit of God bears record with your spirit that your sons and daughters of God in your life bears fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness. Yeah, then you're Christian. If it doesn't, I don't care what you do. Paul said, I could give my body to be burned as a sacrifice. I know all the mysteries of God. I can move mountains with my faith. I can speak in tongues like men and angels. I'm nothing. Amen. How about that? First yeah. Corinthians 13. Find out if that's right or not. Now find out if, if the Corinthians, second Corinthians 13, I believe it is. Or, well, it's either first or second Corinthians. First, first Corinthians. Is that first Corinthians 13? It's right. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, both the kind that can be interpreted and that cannot be interpreted, I'm nothing. So what's use of fooling with it then? Though I understand all the mysteries of God, what do you go to seminaries and try to learn so much about? You better get right with God first. Amen. Certainly. Though I, oh, bless it, hallelujah, you got so you can't even have a congregation that's got a healing campaign or some kind of miracles going on. A weak and adulterous generation seeketh after such. What do you want with that? Paul said he could do all kinds of things, even move mountains, and still he's nothing. Where there's tongues that shall cease, where there's knowledge that shall vanish, where there's prophecies that shall fail. But when that which is perfect is come, it shall endure forever, and love is perfection. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shivers, whosoever shakes, whosoever speaks, whosoever, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Believe that, children. They try to make it so complicated. These things and them things, when it boils right down to one thing, your personal faith in God. Amen. That's it. That tells it. For by faith, not by feeling, by faith, not by emotion, by faith, not by sensation, but by faith are you saved, and that by? Because you sought the Lord. Because you're a good person. Because God, by grace, foreknew you and ordained you to eternal life. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that comes to me, I'll give him eternal life. No man can pluck them from my hand. They're mine. They're forever saved. I got them. <laughs> no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. He is one given to me. They're love, gifts of mine. Amen. And all he foreknew, he called. He don't call anybody unless he foreknew him. All he called, he justified. All he justified, he glorified. So you see, we just said perfect rest. Now, I know there's a lot of legalists here, 99% of you. But look, if you'll just take this and realize, and I'm not trying to say you something that you say, well, Brother Branham, I've always taught I had to do this and I had to do that. <laughs> there's such a, such a difference in it, Brother, in what you have to do and what you want to do. 
You are saved not because you had one thing to do with it. You're saved because that God saved you before the foundation of the world. Listen. Listen here. The Bible said in the Revelation. I'm going to take you from at first to the last now. The Bible said in Revelation that when the beast came, he deceived all upon the earth. The beast did. He deceived all upon the earth whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life since the revival began. Does that sound right? Well, since uh, the preacher preached that mighty sermon, <laughs> since that man was healed, since the foundation of the world. Amen. Where was Jesus slain at? At Calvary? No, sir. Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. Behold the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. God in the beginning, when He saw the sin, He saw what was happening, He spoke the word and Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. And every person was saved, was saved according to the Bible. When the Lamb was slain in the mind of God before the foundation of the world, you were included in salvation damned. Amen. So what are you going to do about it? It's God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's God that worketh. Not him that willeth or him that runneth, but God showeth mercy. If Jesus is slain before the foundation of the world, it taken 4,000 years before it actually happened. But when God spoke it back here, every word of God is steadfast. It's immutable. It's impartable. It cannot fail. And when God slayed the Son before the foundation of the world, He was just as much slain then as He was at Calvary. It's a finished product when God says so. And remember... When the Lamb was slain, your salvation was included in the sacrifice because the Bible said that your name was written on the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Amen. What about that? Now what are we going to do? It's God that shows mercy. It's God that called you. It's God that chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Jesus said, you never, you never chose me, I chose you. And I knew you before the foundation of the world. There you are. So see, that takes the scare out of you. Oh, I wonder if I can keep holding on, I'll make it. Bless God if I just keep holding on. It's not whether I hold on or not, it's whether he held on or not. It's whether what he done, not what I done, it's what he did. It's under the redemption law. This is a little thing I want to say before closing. What if an old mare gave birth to a little mule and that little mule had both ears broke down. He's cross-eyed, knocked, knee, bow-legged, and his tail stuck right straight up in the air. What a horrible looking animal. Why, anybody, that little mule could think, say, now, wait a minute. When they come out from the house this morning, I'm telling you, I'll sure get knocked in the head because they never feed me. <laughs> Look what a horrible looking thing I am. I haven't even got a chance. Oh, that's right. You haven't got a chance. Well, I was born in this world, but look at here, what a horrible looking thing I am. So I, I, I'll never have a chance. I won't make it. I can't make it. See? But what if his mammy is really instructed in the law? she say, son, that's right. You're all out of shape. And you're not even fit to eat the food off the earth. That's right. You're not fit. But son, somehow or another, you're my first. And you know, you're born under a birthright. And the priest will never see you, but for your name, there's got to be an innocent lamb without a blemish has got to die in your place so you can live. Well, that little mule could just kick up his heels and have a big time. Not making a difference what he is, because he'll never be seen by the judge, the priest. It's the lamb that the priest looks at, not the mule, the lamb. And it's Christ that God looks at, not you. It's Christ. So if there's no fault in Him, how can there be fault? How can He find fault? When you're dead and your life is healed in Christ through God, sealed by the Holy Ghost. They that are born of God does not commit sin, for He cannot sin. How can He sin when a perfect sacrifice is laying in His place? 
God never looks at me. He looks at Christ. Because we're in Christ. Now, if I love Christ, I live with Him. He never brought me in unless He knows. If God saved me today knowing He's going to lose me six weeks of a day, He's defeating His own purpose. Right. He don't even know the future then. If He saved me knowing what He wants to save me for, and what He's going to lose me. God doesn't do things and take it back in two weeks to keep His promise. When He saves you, it's for time and eternity. Now you can be worked up and say, Oh, yes, bless God, hallelujah. I spoke a tongue, I shouted, I got her, hallelujah. That don't mean you got it. But brother, when something come down here and you anchor with Christ, then the fruits of the Spirit follow you. We bear a record, our spirit with His Spirit, that we're sons and daughters of God. Please have that, friends. I'll keep you here all night talking about that. I love it. I love you. I come back to this little tabernacle time after time. If God shall spare my life, I want to see you rooted and grounded in that holy faith. I don't want to see you tossed about by every little wind of doctrine come by and shake and carry on and have a little blood in their hands or a little frost on their face or something other than seeing some kind of a, a, a lights before them and some kind of a, a selfish thing, as the Bible said, puffed up in his heart and seen nothing. That's right. I want you to be solid on the word. If it's thus saith the Lord, stay with it. Live with it. That's the urine thundum of this day. God wants you to live by that. If it's not in the Word, then forget about it. Live for God. Live for Christ. And if your heart begins to stray around, you know that something's happened. Go back to the altar and say, Christ, renew my, the joy of my salvation. Give unto me that love that I once had. It's leaking out, Lord. There's something I've done. Make me holy again. Stand, oh, Lord. Nothing I can do. I can't quit this and quit that. I'm looking to you to take it out of me, Lord. And I love you. And walk away from that altar a new person in Christ Jesus. Amen. Then you won't have to depend on your church, depend on your priest, depend on your pastor. You're depending on the shed blood of the Lord Amen. Jesus. By grace are you saved. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, such strong teachings. It's time this little church could take meat and no more the milk of the Word. We've been too much in the milk now, giving the baby his bottle. But we've got to have strong meats for the day is getting close. Great peerless times are at hand and more trouble laying in the road. We know that there'll never be better times. We know that we're at the end. Times will continue to get worse and worse until Jesus comes, according to the Scriptures. We cannot promise them nothing in this life. But in the life to come, we can promise them eternal life through Thy Word. If they'll believe on the Son of God and accept Him as their propitiation, as the one who stood in their place, as the one who took their sins. Grant it now. May unbelievers become believers. May church professors here tonight who profess religion and just living in the church, may they receive an experience with God that such love comes into their heart, that they weep for their sins, die out to themselves and are born anew by the Holy Spirit, and being meek and kind and loving and full of joy and blessings, living such a life that they're so salty that they make the people that's around them thirst to be like them. Grant it, Lord, for we ask it in his name and with our heads bowed. I wonder tonight if there would be one here to say, Brother Branham, if I was weighed in the balance of God at that time, I would never, never, never be able to meet that qualification you're speaking of tonight. I want you to remember me in prayer that I will change my ways and God will come in and take this nonsense out of me and make me a real Christian. Would you raise your hand for prayer as you, if you would? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. In the back. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of all. Yeah. you're thinking now, praying, 
As you feel convinced that you've been wrong and you want to be right, would you just raise your hand saying, God, make me what I ought to be. God bless you, little lady. God, make me what I ought to be. God bless you, brother, sister, you, you, you over here. Day is dying. I know it's hard, friends, but it's better no truth now. I quietly pray. Oh, he holds oh, He's holy alone. Father, as the sun sets in the evening, the robins gather in the trees with their loved ones. The birds all go to their nest. The doves fly up on the wires high so the snakes won't bother them through the night. They sit there and coot each other till they go to sleep. The sun finally sets. Someday we're coming down to that hour. The sunsets go to happen. I don't know when, Lord, but there's people here tonight who's convinced that they've been wrong. They want to come to that place like Lincoln come to it as he was dying. They had turned my face towards the setting sun and he started our Father who art in heaven. As Moody of old said, is this death? This is my carnation day. Oh, eternal one, receive them just now by faith as they sit there in their seats. You knocked at their heart at the seat. That's their altar. This is the time for you to receive them just now. You said, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And someday when sun is setting, wife or husband is standing by the bed. The doctors walked away. Oh, holy, holy. That beautiful, sweet hush just before the sun sets. When we could raise up and say, Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me, may there be no moaning at the bar when I put out the sea. Oh, God granted to them this hour while they wait, waiting for the blessing of God to come upon them. Take all of the temper all of the world away from them and create in them a new heart. You said, I'll take the old heart away and put in a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit in that heart. And they shall walk in my statues and keep my commandments because it's an ordinance of love and not of duty. It's of love. And love constrains us to do it. It's a duty of love to constrain us. It's our duty to follow love. And I pray, God, that you'll give it to every heart that raised their hand tonight. And those who did not raise their hand, may they now by grace raise their hands to accept you and to be filled with your spirit in this meek, sweet, quiet, humble way. Be full of grace. Go out of here as a changed person. How the birds will sing different. How everybody will be different after this hour. O oh Lord most high. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Father, heaven and earth are full of thee. Now with your heads bowed, you who raised your hands to be remembered in prayer, do you feel like it? God has spoke to you in such a way now? 
Not by emotion, but just something weighed down in you. You feel like it. God has given you eternal life. You feel like you're going out of the church tonight as a different person. Would you raise your hands back tonight? God bless you, son. God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. God bless you. That's right. I'll go from this church tonight. A new person. Newborn babes. In the kingdom of God. What happened? I know it's an order of coming to the altar. That's a Methodist altar. A Methodist order, I mean. It was established in the Methodist church in the days of John Wesley. It never was in the Bible days. As many as believed was added to the church. You can believe wherever you are, out in the field, out on the street, anywhere. Anywhere. It doesn't make any difference. Just so as you accept Christ as your personal Savior, it's an act of the Holy Ghost that comes into your heart. When you believe Him, accepting you pass from death unto life and you become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Pass me not, O oh gentle Now stand to your feet. My humble cry. Why hast thou art calling? A dear not pass me. Now I want the young man and the lady which I perceive to be his wife. It raised up your hand. I want you to raise your hand again back there. Some with the red coat on and the lady that they accepted Christ as their personal Savior. The young man sitting here in a wheelchair accepted Christ as his Savior, felt that God had saved him. And others back in there that raise your hands, raise them again so that people can look around, have fellowship with you. Shake your hand, somebody around, standing near them. Say, God bless you. Welcome into the kingdom of God, my brother, my sister. Fellowship. That's what we want. God bless. Shake hands with this young man here in the chair. The Lord be with him. That's right. We welcome you into the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. If you have never been baptized as yet and would desire to be baptized, make your way up and tell the pastor about it. The pool here has even got water in it tonight if you want to be baptized. Everything's ready. Did you have a baptism anyhow? But the pool is ready. If anybody want to be baptized, the Bible said repent every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises to you and your children, damn as far off as many as the Lord our God shall call. Do you love him? Raise your hands. Oh, isn't he wonderful? How you enjoy this book of Hebrews? You love it? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Now it's correction. Oh, it's stern and it's straight. But we love that. That's the way we want to have it. Wouldn't have it no other way. Now, do you believe Paul's got an authority to preach it like that? Paul said, if an angel come and preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Is that right? So we love him with all of our heart. Now, I'm going to ask the pastor to come here just a moment. Our most precious brother, Brother Neville, and you'll have a word to tell you. And now, if the Lord willing, we'll see you Wednesday night and make arrangements about going to Brother Grim Snelling's for a congregational night. And then for the preaching here to continue on with the 7th and 8th chapter this coming Wednesday night. Amen. Brother Neville.